going golfing this weekend? I might, yeah. I got a I got a podcast recording too at the same time. That's why I got this mic right here. So it's a little like multitasking. Sure. You hear us all right on ours? Yeah. You guys hear me good? Yeah. All right. Let me check this audio real quick. Whoa. Yo, 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 yo. Right, that's good. Holy shit. I mean, this could be pretty informal. Um, I don't do too many interviews because I, um, because COVID. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's got everything a little different now. You guys might be opening up a new world to me, though, to do the Zooms, the Zoom meetings, because it's pretty easy to do it. Yeah. And you can share your screen and stuff on there, too. I can share my screen. I'm recording this right now, so yep. I can edit stuff later, too, because I got, um, got like software for it or whatever. So we probably do like three or four Zooms a day. Um, before Zoom, we were doing like beam your screen, and it, it was kind of like a it's archaic now, but it would we would if people could wouldn't see us, but they would just see the screen. It was a sharing thing, and we um, you can't really like ask somebody to download a program to to have a, some type of meeting. So um, I don't know. Zoom's worked out fine, and Justin prefers the forty minute version because it's like. Yeah, and you don't have to go too long, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's off, right? You're like, like we're done, you know. <laughs> I don't think people have the attention span for much more than forty minutes in most things, anyway. Yeah, that's probably why they have it set up like that. So it's forty minutes. They know people start checking out mentally. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so, so what do you guys do? You guys, uh, same business, like same uh, you guys, like business partners or something, or. Yeah, we do, we do full service financial planning. So yeah, Gabe and I are business partners. We have our own office here. Um, you know, we, we do investments and insurance and everything basically to do with money and reaching your financial goals. Yeah. That's good. Cause I have a few questions about that. We could dive into if that's cool. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, our goal is really just to put a plan together for people in kind of uh, it's like a roadmap. And uh, most often People have never seen it before because it's not something that we've learned like in secondary or even in college, even in a finance course that we take, you know, you don't really get any of uh, hey, compounding interest and what it looks like in a 401k over 20, 25 years and why it's important to start investing now, you know, when you're in your 20s or your 30s, as opposed to like in your mid 40s and you're like, all right, I want to retire at 59, well, let's do this. It doesn't really work like that, you know. Got to wait till they're seventy to pull money out then. Yeah, yeah pretty much. People don't want to do that either. <laughs> That's so, right, man. I mean, life happens, you know. So, it's, um, unless you stay at the same company, but a lot of people move companies. You know, they pull their four hundred one ks out and all that stuff. We should preference that I've known you since college, right? Yeah, yeah. We Gabe and I, we go back. Uh, you know, I'm forty one right now. So I was like 25, 26 when I met you. Wow. You were catching like little fish in the American River. And, I, you know, I remember I was catching big fish. And, you know, I showed Bone how to tie a knot. And he had the boat, though. I will say he was a, he was a better fisher than me. Yeah, you know, all the maintenance on the boat and crap. You guys got to focus on having fun when I was yeah, in the and all that stuff. A boat's a pain. I mean, with, with – you could just show up with a six pack and be a hero. And you know, that's just better to know somebody that's got both, my opinion. <laughs> I, you know, so I do remember those days, like you and I, or even Eric Carlson, we would just like, it seemed like we went every other day, whether we went to like Miller Delta, uh, the feather sack river, it's just like, it was wherever we wanted to go. We would just roll the little nomad out because it was, there's nothing to it. And I, I think back and I'm like, man, I, I miss like being able at the fucking flip of a deck quarter. You just like, all right, let's go fishing. And yeah. you know you care, right? And now, you know, you got fans, you got kids, and you can't necessarily just do that. And, and plus, you know, you're, we were set up, you know, so it's almost like if you're doing something like that, like fishing, you're just, um, it's like everything's ready. You know, it's like kind of like if you go camping after you go a few times, you got all the gear, you know exactly what to bring, yeah. what not to bring and all that stuff. So things, things have definitely changed. 
Hey, can we uh, can we get these beers open real quick? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Sorry. I know we can bullshit, but you know, you want to drink this the pleasure wave first? Yeah, it's a lower ABV. So for those who are gonna watch this, you guys are cool with me airing it. This is the pleasure wave seven percenter from Alvarado Street. Where, where are they from? Um, right in Monterey, like on yeah. Alvarado Street. Well, they're they're a legit brewery. We we all have matching beers, which is really cool. So I um. So, uh, well, Justin and I, our office is in Runner Park. We, um, we, um, well, we're in Sonoma County, if people don't know where Runner Park is, right? And uh, we've got like a plethora of breweries here. And I've just become a, I think, I beer snob. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, you know, like we've got this, uh, we've got Old Cas, we've got Ten House, we've got another one, new, a new player. Called Far Parliament that's opened up. Old Possum. Every, uh, Every old Possum's all right. <laughs> um, good too, you know, out there. They have good food. They yeah, they got yeah. good food. Russian River, you know, which I I actually put them to a little lower on my totem pole, just because Pliny the Pliny the Younger yeah. is fit, wow, it's fantastic. And they recently came out with Pliny the President, which is really good. But um, and then we got Bear Republic that uh, through the haze, but I'm not. I'm not really into um, like a lot of those beer, uh, bourbon aged or barrel aged beers oh, yeah. and sours. Uh -huh. And that's the kind of their uh, their profile. They do a lot of those and I'm like, eh. So I'm kind of over here. But um, Beer Craft and Middle Rincon Valley Tap Room are kind of like the little places that we're able to get this Alvarado Street or uh, Humble Sea or Cellar Maker. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh -huh. We we were getting slice, which is up in Lincoln, yep. in Moonraker, uh, new not so much New Glory, but um, you know there's fantastic beers, or even that St. St. Andarius too, which is out of uh, Santa Cruz. So I, you just drink all this really good beer, and then you know you have a beer that's from like Bear Republic, and you're like, eh. <laughs> they yeah, haven't really of... evolved too much, you know, because everybody. My theory is that since COVID came out, um, the breweries have a lot more time to make different cans. So, you know, some of them are the same beer with different labels, but they're just pumping out a bunch of new cans and products because they're not selling it on tap as much. Yeah. So make up for it somehow. And they're actually reaching a big audience too by selling these cans, like different cans that people could try. This one smells very good. This is a seven percenter. This smells very good. It's good. A little piney, but so Justin's more of a novice beer drinker, right? So when we go to, um, I just tag along and take some recommendations. <laughs> in in Katati, they have this like flagship, flag, yeah, flagship mm -hmm. tap room, and he just goes, "You know what I want, Gabe?" And I really don't know what he wants, but I'm. <laughs> but he figures to, it out. I kind of <laughs> figure it out. I did. I did uh, fuck him over one time. We uh, what was it Dogfish Head. 90 minute ale or 120 minute whatever it was it was like 16.3 yeah i think that was eight, 20, it, it did yeah. not taste that strong it tastes i mean it was strong but it was it went down really smooth it was really good um i took another one next thing you know i'm like what did you do to me gabe i'm um i'm feeling these like <laughs> you're gonna, i think you're gonna have to drive me home <laughs> that that day was really memorable because i was the first time i had a milkshake ipa and uh, there's this Barrel Brothers, which is an, out of Windsor. Uh -huh. They had uh, milk was a bad choice. And it had all I said, I just was doing talking to it. And I said, oh, uh, unfiltered IPA. And I said, oh, I'll try that. But then I didn't look that it had milk, lactose, and lactose, strawberry. Yeah. Mess with you the next day sometimes. And I, I was like, when somebody served it, it was just like this. <laughs> It looked like a Odwalla juice, right? And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is this, dude? Would and then you... the guys are making fun of me. I, I took one sip and I was um, I was a believer in milk stouts ever since. So that's right on. that was that, that was a memorable day because <laughs> I got a, I got hand drunk on three <laughs> beers and I had something I never had before. Right on. Yeah, there's um I mean I obviously follow beer very closely. Milkshake beers, sours, and um, the the barrel aged stouts are actually very popular with like the niche market at this point. 
but obviously the hazies are still like number one, like across, like that's how I judge a good brewery is if they make a good IPA, like IPA, hazy IPA, it's almost like ordering a burrito at a new taqueria. You're almost like if they can make a good burrito at a taqueria, they probably make everything else is probably good. And that's just how I judge it. So. Is it, well, the hazy IPA, that's like one of the more inexpensive beers to make? Uh, it depends on the alcohol percentage, but no, because they usually use a lot more hops and a lot more grain. So the higher alcohol percentage, the more grain, um, but IPAs just use a shitload of hops. That's just what they do. So um, the hops are expensive. But I, I also heard that Kolsch's. That what? Kolsch's take long or more expensive. Is that because they just take longer? Yeah, so, process? yeah, the, like, loggers, loggers take, like, six to eight weeks to ferment for the most part. So, you could pump an IPA out, IPA out in, like, a week or two. Going back to my theory of, like, why these breweries are um, coming out with new uh, IPAs all the time, because they're, like, seven to ten days to pump out. Um, where you get loggers and colches and stuff like that, it's going to take, like, six weeks. So, in regards to, like, holding, um, you know, holding inventory, you're taking up space in the fermenter for six weeks versus 10 days. That's why they're more expensive. Gotcha. Taking a more real estate. We stayed at, uh, we were in Santa Cruz for like nine days and the Humble Sea was- Very good brewery. Four blocks, right? And I swear, I was like, these motherfuckers, these guys are coming out with beers every day. I felt like I was drinking. Yeah. I was trying to keep up with all the cans. Uh, and again, they're one of the first places that did double dry hop. Uh, that did well, I should say. Uh, and uh, I'm a total fan of that. You know, you kind of get into the little intricacies of beers and it's not necessarily like, oh, I like hazy beers. I'm like, well, I kind of like double dry hop beers. Yeah, that gives it more aroma. Like dry hopping yeah. is basically the beers fermenting or almost fermented. And then you just throw a crap load of hops in it to get aroma from it. And that actually gives you a better perceived taste, believe it or not. Because, you know, our smell and our taste are connected or whatever. So... So as as a more of a novice beer drinker, what do you think about this? Oh, I love it. Um, I mean, I, for me, I like IPAs. I like West Coast IPAs. So this is this would be like one of the kind of go to things that I would drink personally. For sure. Yeah, it's like light and fruity. It's crisp. <clears throat> it's a uh, it's good like good fall beer. I would say. I I forget like man West Coast IPA. Well, because <clears throat> I like hazy so much that. But once you have a hazy, you really can't get off that track, right? You can't really go, oh, let me try this West Coast because it's, no, you have to have that West Coast first. It's like drinking wine, right? You start with the white wine or champagne first. And then once you move to red, you better stay there. <laughs> you don't want to ruin your palate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same thing goes with beer. So. I think Gabe ruined my palate one time. He gave me a really, really heavy dark beer first. <laughs> I don't remember what it was, but it was like, it was thick. <laughs> thick. <laughs> dark, dark, thick beer. You said it was dark. It was pretty thick. Yeah. It was, Where were we? It was pretty heavy. Was it, it a was stout? definitely high? Yeah, it might have been. Might have been a yeah, stout. Yeah. Had, yeah. Maybe we we're at flagship, and I, I don't know. Yeah, you've made I don't remember. breweries that I don't even. I've, I've never heard of. So, like, I'm kind of interested now. I mean, I would like to come over there and just go on another. Last yeah, time, even I hung out. Good ones mm -hmm. around here. We last time we hung out, we went to quite a few. We went to Bear Republic, Cooperage. Um, he basically took me on a little like uh, brewery tour of the area. Oh yeah, that's because my lady kicked us out. Well, we were making booze your that first day, and I had, but yeah, I had like a, I had like a four month old or five month old. And she's like, you can't be just making booze and getting all <laughs> drunk. And we were, I don't even feel like I was drunk, but uh, or maybe she was pregnant. So I don't know. She was just on one. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, you know what? It sounds like I got a free night. And so me and the bone, oh, do they, people, uh, have you addressed yourself as the bone? Yeah, that's cool, man. I mean, my okay. listeners, I never like, I, I just don't call myself the bone, but I'm good with it. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it's just, it comes out, you know, like naturally. Oh, good. Yeah. It's all good. Bone for like 15 years. That's another story, I guess, for your podcast. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <That's right>. uh, <laughs> we'll keep that one on the wraps. Um, anyways. Lost yeah, episode. We, we went, man, we went out and then we ended up crashing at my uh, on my husband's right. couch at my Carlos. Cause oh, that's right. Okay, I forgot where we passed out. That, that was a yeah, but we made a ton of booze, man. It was like uh, I had somebody 
give me like cases of wine that was like oh, I heard about this. It, it was like if some were good, yeah. some were bad, and so we were just like putting them in the in your still. Do you still have that chimney still? Yeah, I do. And uh, we made like five gallons of shine, or I guess it's it's almost grappa without the skin. If you want to get technical, right? And then you but, put it with like watermelon and all that stuff, and that shit was good. I, I yeah, I, I, put, I remember you. I put the watermelon, that, yeah. and then I did a, like a like a fresh apple batch. So I went to Sebastopol and had a friend that had an apple orchard, and they let me do like uh, cold pressed apple juice, and then I just combined them. And I was like handing those out for like Christmas, like these <laughs> little like booze cups, and people loved them. I thought they were pretty tasty, but. Uh, there's a joke that I had so much booze in the house, you know, when the tub's fire came. The joke was like, oh, it really happened because I had all that booze that was still left in the house. So that's what it was a minor fire. Yeah, it was a minor <laughs> until fire. Until it hit your house. <laughs> and that's what blew it up. So right on. So so you guys are um Justin, do you golf too? Uh casually. I mean Gabe Gabe likes to say that he golfs, but then last time I went with him I did better than he did. So I don't know. <laughs> That was a long time ago. If there's not a golf cart and there's not some sort of, you know, beverage to enjoy, you know, that, that's the kind of golf that I enjoy. I don't take it too seriously. For sure. Because um, I'm definitely not good enough to take it serious. But, yeah, yeah. But, hey. It's, Otherwise, it's, you'll just be mad the whole time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good time. It's, uh, you know, it's a good good friend friendship builder, dude. It's I mean, you get out there with a good crew and there, there's nothing quite as fun as doing, <clears throat> doing something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, so – in the past, Justin and I, we've rented out breweries for like a client slash friend appreciation quarter. Yeah. We, we were doing it every quarter, right? And so I combined some of my cooking abilities and we would just for a couple hours, hey, we're just going to buy a couple of kegs or we're going to just pick up the cab. And um, we were just... We were, Beer and food yeah, and it, connection. No business, right? Yeah, we were just, just having a good time. Good and, connection. COVID happened, so we've really had to backtrack. But I've gone golfing, and I was like, well, you know, you can socially distance and go golfing. And so my, I love golfing. That's a week better. The, the thing that I don't like about golfing is when I go, you know, it's a four or five hour day, you're kind of in the sun, <laughs> and you're pounding, you know, six to 12 beers. <laughs> I'm toast. Like, no matter yep. what time I go, I'm done for like the day. Yeah. So if I'm done off the course by two o'clock, like, I'm just like late. I'm laid out. <laughs> I'm just done. It's the end of it. Yeah. You know what? I really put your whole a whole day into it. <laughs> I actually I stop. I really stop drinking when I play golf, and I, I'll drink when I'm done, because I I'm like starting to compete with myself. I can see myself get better, and uh, the little increments, and I I don't want to inhibit my ability to play or a couple take a couple strokes off. Every I, time I go out there. I talked so much smack last time that he had to start taking it really serious. <laughs> so got under his skin. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's one of those things where it's like I had never I hadn't played in twenty something years and it's not for me it wasn't like you know, you say get on the bike and get no, it was like Yeah, it's you gotta practice. Fundamentally, you know, like I'm like a hundred pounds bigger, my swing's not it's just everything's all kind of thrown off and so got to take time and just be patient i think it's the putting you gotta you gotta really zone that in that's where you just find all the all the errors <laughs> in my um, game at least if i if i could just tighten that up a little bit <laughs> i would love to play i mean i might play this yeah. with my buddies but um my wife's a little leery she's like how good are your friends social distancing? And I'm like, shit, I don't want to interview him about that. It's like, I get it. We're, we have our own carts, but I, I don't want to be the weird guy who says, how responsible have you guys been? And I know they haven't really been because a couple of them are, are in sales and they're like interacting with people all the time. So I'm like, ah, it's probably not going to happen. Well, hey, we've been pretty good. I mean, Gabe's, uh, Gabe's lady is a slave driver nurse. So he's kind of, you know, <laughs> she's following it by the book. We've been working remote, so you know, <clears throat> keeping it pretty small interaction. I, you know what though, I, I'm telling you though, it, golfing, it's pretty easy to social distance. It's like you're not touching any like, clubs. Yeah, you don't. You, you don't be on top of each other. Even like, uh, even when you sink the ball in the hole, more often than not, they they either have like a a little cup where you just 
you don't have to reach your hand in there. Yeah. Uh, so most of the courses, the new rule is if you're in the sand trap, you get a free drop, and then you can't pull out the um, the pin, right? So yeah. again, I, I for me, it's it's nice because it's pretty low risk activity. Yeah, definitely low risk. You know, you just even when you're in the tee box, it's really easy to stand away from people. So I have actually have a couple questions for you guys though, dude, because we got like yeah. a couple votes left on this Zoom. Um, I want to know, um, what's the best investment for my kids? So let me, let me just listen to me here for a minute. Cause I got a little backstory. So when you're like in the economics class in high school, right? They tell you, Oh, if you put like 20 bucks a week away until you're like 40, you'll have a million bucks, right? That's assuming that you're going to have compound interest. So I guess the first part of the question is where are you going to get a guaranteed five, 6% return on a comp compound interest account? Cause you're not just, you can't just like, they don't teach you that. That's what they don't teach yeah. you where you put your money at. Second question is what is the best way to, for me or people that have young kids and you're saving money, you know, I'm saving money for them every month, 50, hundred bucks, whatever, just throwing it in my savings account. Um, but what is like a good low risk compound interest that I could give to them, um, set them up with, right? Where, where could I put that money? That's going to be pretty safe. And I don't want them to touch it until they're like 40. So they have like one, two mil, whatever, right? Um, or even longer, just kind of have like like a guaranteed. Um, yeah, you like making them a pension. Yeah. yeah so two part question there. Maybe you guys could talk so, about that a little bit. I guess my first question is how old are your kids? Uh, um, five years old. Five years five old. Years old okay. And uh, two. <laughs> so when you say, when you say what's going to be the safest place, you know, the first thing, if we're taking a look at kind of history, you know, we're in a way different situation with, with how things are going compared to like our parents' generation and our grandparents' generation. Grandparents' generation could put money in the bank and safely earn a, a great rate of return, right? Now you can't get any return in the bank. You know, our parents' generation, probably six to eight percent in the market was considered really good. Uh, you could get six to that right now though, right? It's like 1.6 or something ridiculous. No. Yeah. Yeah. For guaranteed safe stuff. Yeah. You're, you're lucky to get over 1%, but I mean, you look at the historical performance of the market and, and back in the day it was, Hey, if you could get 7% per year, you're doing pretty good. Now in the last 10, 15 years, you're seeing the S and P 500 hit that 10%, hit the double digit growth because of these tech companies and, things that are accelerating the growth. You know, like we were working with a, um, a surgeon, a dental surgeon, and he, he's able to do a seven hour, $40,000 surgery in like two hours now because of technology. So it's all these little advancements that you see happening because of technology that are making companies grow faster and become more profitable. So what I think we're gonna see in our generation is a lot less guaranteed returns because the banks don't want to pay that. They can take our money for free and, and better returns for those who are willing to invest their money. So with that being said, I mean, the idea is if your children are five years old and you don't want them to touch it till they're 40, the market is a safe place to put that money because there's been no period ever in the stock market that in 35 years, you wouldn't have grown your money. So now if you wanted to buy a house next year, I wouldn't tell you to put the money in the market a month before the election, <laughs> you know, but, but so it's all relative. What is the money for? If my money is for short term goals, then yes, I need, I need it in something that's guaranteed or low risk or low volatility. But if I want, you know, if I want it 10, 20, 30 years down the road, I want to invest it for the long term. I want to be a little more aggressive with that money because yeah. all that's going to happen is I'm going to have more ups and downs. But in the end, my end result is going to be a lot greater. Yeah. Gotcha. And if, if you're talking about like individual products, you know, like a, a 529 is available. Um, cash value life insurance is available. There's brokerage the, accounts. Yeah, brokerage accounts. You know, the, the advantage, there's pros and cons to a lot of different things. You know, with the, with the 529s, that's great if you want to set them up, but it's for school. Yeah, it's that's for higher great. education. So if they don't go to college, there's ways it can be passed to different, your a different, uh, you know, a sibling or a niece or nephew, things like that. Um, but if you're putting all this money away and then they don't go to school, 
you know, what do I do now? You know, Gabe mentioned life insurance. There's a, there's a way that you can use cash value life insurance to create a similar nest egg for your children. Doesn't have to be used for school. And then a brokerage account would be a way to do it where um, you, you've got a little more investment control. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. But me personally, I like to put my money in everything. So I don't want to just have life insurance or just have a brokerage account or just have a 529. Bitcoin. Yeah. Or, you know, I, yeah. I, <laughs> a little unregulated, so I'm not going to go there with advice. But, <laughs> you know, yeah, when something like Bitcoin comes out, it's new and you haven't heard of it, it that, that's called speculation. Five or 10% of what you're doing should be speculating. You know, our grandparents' generation, they bought land in places that they thought that's speculating. And a lot of them who bought in California were correct. They're making, you know, you look at, I have a client in Palo Alto that owns three houses that they bought for $40,000 like 50 years ago. And now they're three and a half million each. <laughs> and, and they're just regular houses. They haven't been updated since the 80s, 70s or 80s, you know. Um, you know, but that was speculation to buy the, and then, oh, okay, all of a sudden that becomes the tech bubble of, of or tech hub of California. I have so many so, questions. So many questions as you're talking to. Um, do you mind if yeah. I ask a few? Yeah, yeah just man, whatever you, whatever. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. So one question about the 529, because I do have a scholar share account set up for my kids. Um, I put in like another 50 bucks or something like that each or whatever. So say they decide not to go to school or whatever, or I'm like, I'm not going to waste all this, you know, money for you just to go to school. You don't even study good, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Right? Could I roll that over into another investment account, like a 401k or something like that? Well, you're gonna have to pay taxes on, on, that, on the growth yeah. of that. So the benefit of the 529 is that anything that grows in there is tax-free, if used for the, the approved things, you know? So, so, hey, they don't go to school. What if they go to a trade school? That could potentially be used for that. Um, you know, maybe any sort of higher education, you know, potentially you could use for, for credentials outside of, you know, like a regular college. But yeah, what would happen ultimately is that the growth becomes a taxable um, occurrence if you want to move it. So, so then it becomes that over into like, man, that, okay, so that's, that's so one thing. example, you, you could roll that into, you could pay the taxes and roll it into a, a rock. Or you could pull, pay the taxes and put it in your brokerage account. There's a lot of different strategies. If you're a business owner, there's a huge amount of ways to defer your uh, your taxes. Uh, if you're an individual, you can put about six thousand. You can only do about six thousand per year. So I mean, you could move six thousand out and then defer it in an IRA every year. But if you're talking about like you're talking where hey, I want to accumulate a million dollars for my child. That's going to take a long time to move and not get taxed on. So, so sometimes it is better to use those things that are, you know, like a brokerage account. Uh, it, it's just a little more flexible and that you could be the owner of because then you have the ultimate decision and control over it. Because you don't really know what your kids are going to be like 10, 25 years from now. You know, like, I hope, I hope that they're good and I hope it's, there's no issue, but there is that possibility that, you know. So. Yeah, just like maybe irresponsible like I was at 18 like my mom gave me a few thousand bucks and said make something happen with it and I think I bought a like a gaming system and <laughs> like a stereo for my car and a, <laughs> hey, this is not the 22s oh. yeah <laughs> so okay. that made you popular right <laughs> to throw you guys a challenging question here this is a very challenging question this is actually a concern that I have okay so I don't know if you remember back in 08 Justin I don't know if you were you know, still a minor at that point or what? <laughs> no, you actually, are. you want to know the funny part? March 9th, 2009, when the market hit the very, very bottom, it was my 18th birthday. Okay. Okay. So I'm like, congratulations. That's what was wrong. <laughs> you, <laughs> right? Congratulations. You're an adult. Here's the worst economy that has existed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You graduated right then. Um, yeah, so like I think the Dow was down to like seven thousand points or six thousand something at that point. So right now, the Dow is at like what twenty eight thousand something like that. There's a lot of money going out from the government. Like, hey, here's a stimulus check. You know, oh, here's misguided yep. stimulus checks. I mean, do you how do you think the market might be inflated? And 
you already kind of answered this, Justin, about like diversifying a little bit. Cause I do invest in, um, in crypto as well. Like I do a couple hundred bucks a month, just yeah. kind of throw it in there, you know, but, um, but you know, I, I think about like the nest eggs, like these people that have been working for 20, 30 years, right. They have their 401ks they're withdrawing, you know, a couple thousand a month. They might be riding high right now. Right. They might be like, Oh, I'm taking 3000 a month back home. I was expecting two. However, they're basing it off if the Dow stays at 28,000 and grows. There's a little fear that I have personally that what if it crashes down back to that seven? You know, that's like what, negative 400% and something like that? I mean, what do you guys think about that? Just any thought? So, so here, here's what I, would, what I would say about about the market is that, yeah, we're printing money, you know, we're distributing money. But the, the reason that we're able to get away with it to an extent is because a lot of the other parts of the world have done the same thing. So in a way we're being balanced out. You know, if we were the only one affected, if our country was the only country that had any effect of the coronavirus um, and the pandemic, then that would be a big issue if we just start basically devaluing our currency, printing, stimulus, all that. But, um, but there are other countries that are doing similar things, maybe not to the extent that we're doing, but, when you look at, hey, what, what could happen in the market? You know, there's always gonna be uncertainty around an election. Um, I think now more than ever between the pandemic and then on the West Coast on fire and then the potential problems with hurricanes. And, you know, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of moving parts in America. And I think that, that what it comes down to is that you need, when you're investing in the market or when you're investing in anything that's a paper asset. So a paper asset would be, something where the value is just a number on paper. It can go up or down at any time, right? A fixed asset never goes down in, val in actual dollar amount, right? So that's what you would consider safe or more conservative or real wealth, right? So, so paper assets, when I'm investing in paper assets, that is money that's earmarked for 10 or more years. You know, my goal, yeah, you know, you can play around with individual stocks, cryptocurrencies, we can get much bigger returns on more aggressive, more speculative things, but ultimately you need to be ready to be able to hold on for the long term. And so if you're not planning to be on the market for at least five years, then I'd be concerned about a potential crash. But it, if even if the market did crash that drastically, um, which I don't think will happen, I don't think it will crash that much. Um, you know, usually what we would expect in a massive crash is 30 to 45%. In, in a in a massive crash, there's really only been a few like that. I mean, um, 2008-9 was one of them. The dot com boom, you know, their bubble. March. Um, March of this year was one of the, one of the biggest ones. It was hitting <clears throat> records from the Great Depression, um, and we still didn't even get that bad. And it was still only like 40 percent, give or take. Um, our a lot of our clients that were, you know, I my worst example of clients were the clients that invested like. They started their investment plans like five days before March, before the crash. And th those clients are, are positive today. Um, is, could that stay the same? Maybe not. But we're looking at re-strategizing for those clients for what if there is a potential correction again, because we're not, we're not out of the woods. Um, if, if there is a, a market correction, that's in a way like our conversation between the three of us, because our time horizon is for another 20, 25 years. That's good, right? Because it resets kind of when we put the money in. So when in March came, I think I invested like $3,000 into the market. I was like, I'm gonna put it in because now I am buying at the floor as opposed to continuing to buy at the, the top, right? And so you have to weigh that. And we're our strategy is not to put people into a situation where say there is a 30% correction, right? that's gonna take food off your table or that's going to like uh, put you in a situation where you can't retire. I mean, we have different strategies that our conversation is if you're a 50 year old or a 55 year old and you're trying to retire in five years, let's put like a floor or let's, let's talk about an option where we're going to ensure that that nest egg is there even if there is a dip in the market. Um, Let me ask you a question. Um, where where are you located? I didn't catch that. Like Sacramento? Sacramento. Where are they? Yeah. In Sacramento? Yeah. How much is the average house over there right now? Uh, dude, Middle of the road kind I, of. Dude, that's another concern I have. But I mean, I'm, I'm in good settings, but I would say for a three bedroom, two bathroom, whether you have a bigger house or a smaller yard, on average, 
it's probably about maybe 400,000. 400. So if, if tomorrow the market crashed and you could pick those up for 200,000, would you? Absolutely. And that's why I'm saving some of my cash. The stock market is the same thing. If, if you bought, if you had money that was not in the market and the market crashed in March and you took that money and bought in on the way down all the way through March, um, you would in most cases have double or triple what you put in. And, and if you were lucky enough to put money in a company like Tesla or any of these tech companies that have taken off, you could have as much as 10 times the way you put in. Because, so, so my point is, when we're making people's portfolios and talking about investing, you want to have some money that's in the market, but you want to have some that's out of the market. Because if the market crashes, that money, we know we're keeping it in the long run. Yes. But instead of just letting it recover, let's average it out and buy at the low. And that way, when it recovers, we're actually ahead of where we were. And so that's automatic. That's called asset reallocation. And so typically you want to, you want to reallocate your assets quarterly. So you want to, you want to pick kind of a target, you know, for me, I'd say 75% aggressive, 25% safe for all my assets. And what I'm going to do is at the end of the quarter, if all of a sudden the market's way up and now I have 80 or 90% up top, I'm going to sell some of that off and capture those gains. If, if my 20, you know, on the, on the opposite end, if the market's crashing and now I have 60 percent of the market 40 percent i'm going to start buying in and put myself back in that 70 25 goal that, that ensures that you buy low sell buy low sell high so we're so we're kind of like you know almost out of time here could i ask um if you guys you guys want to plug your business where could people find you, you guys sound like you know what you're talking about yeah yeah <laughs> thank you um <laughs> I, I, I think I saw your Instagram. I can tag on Instagram, JL Financial on Instagram. Uh, uh, JLFinancialSolutions.net is our website where you can learn more about us. Um, you know, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy just to, give me the info too because I'll just tag you guys and stuff. You know, you guys have a page and all that too on Instagram? Yeah, yeah. Got an Instagram, yeah. Hey, touch The second beer right here. This is Three Men in a Hazy. It's an 8% double IPA. Yeah. What do you guys think about that? This one right here, this beer. Kind of like shifting uh, gears really quick. I mean, we probably could go for like two, three hours, but. You know. I know, right? <laughs> we might have to do a follow up. <laughs> smells, yeah, for sure. Totally. What do, you, what do you guys think though? Smell good? It smells okay, but it, it tastes better than it smells. <laughs> my uh, Galaxy my man came into our office and he's a, he's a beer guy. And so I actually gave him one of these cans instead of us having our individual <laughs> ones because he's a good dude, man. He, you know, he gets our shit here. And I support the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plug for the Postal Service. All right, all right. Hardworking, right. hardworking. Yeah, it's uh, a all yeah. street is a solid brewery. Um, I got these beers from Hop Gardens. So my buddy, Matt, you know, Matt, I think, you know, Matt, yeah, yeah. Hawkins owns the Hop Gardens and they actually have like some of the best beers. So if you ever, you guys ever come to town, Sacramento, go there. I'm just going to say it. Just plug B minus show that the motherfucker knows. Hey, Sean sent these motherfuckers. Right. But they actually, I could say legitimately on the, on the airwaves that he has some of the best beers that I have encountered in for sure in Sacramento. Um, but Hey, that's why that beer craft man and and uh, Rinkin Valley Tap Room they they actually they travel. before COVID they, they you know they have taps so you try the beers and then they bring in Matt over here which is in Runner Park he's got a shop in Novato he cares man he like there's no uh, mass distributing beers he even drives in Monterey to pick up beers sometimes but passionate for uh, I've never been to the other this is because this is a collaboration beer. Other brother beer. Oh shit! I've never yeah. been to um, other brother beer, and so this where's is the at? first time I've had. I don't even know where it's at. I just noticed it was a collaboration. Well, hey guys, um, thank you very much. I'm gonna end the recording right now. We can keep chatting though, but yeah, let me stop this recording. Thank you everybody for listening. Be minus show. Look these guys up. I'm gonna tag them.